We are looking at the Tokyo War Crimes trial. Uh, this was in 1946, so after the uh, United States occupied Japan after the war was over, um, putting the Japanese on trial, specific members of the Japanese government and the military on trial. And we're going to keep looking at this big question, was the U.S. occupation of Japan largely beneficial or was it detrimental? Uh, just to give you an outline of where we're going, we will mention uh, some brief context from the Potsdam Declaration, which we've already looked at, and then uh, we'll segue into the Tokyo trial and um, this larger reading that I uh, wanted you to look at. And we'll talk a little bit about the trial's legacy um, today. So just to be clear, remember the Potsdam Declaration in 1945, July 1945, Article 10 gave the Allies authority to put the Tokyo, um, I'm sorry, to put the uh, Japanese uh, members of the government on trial at the Tokyo trial. And this is part of Article 10 where it says, uh, we do not intend that the Japanese shall be enslaved as a race or destroyed as a nation, but stern justice shall be meted out to all war criminals, including those who have visited cruelties upon our prisoners. And I put stern justice, those, that, that's my emphasis, I put it in bold and italics. And this is really where the authority comes from to conduct these trials at all. The trials took place, this is a picture of the uh, building. It, you know, technically it was called the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, IMTFE, which is a little bit harder to remember than simply the Tokyo War Crimes Trial or Tokyo Trial. Okay, so this took place um, from May 1946 to November 1948, a two year, more than two years um, long trial, a two and a half year long trial. Uh, so it was a very long uh, process. There were three main charges, okay, and these are the same charges, if you're familiar at all with the Nuremberg Trial, same charges that you see in the Nuremberg Trial. Uh, crimes against peace. So the defendants were charged with violating uh, the peace that existed after the First World War. By uh, going to war, they broke the peace. So that was a crime against peace. Uh, war crimes. War crimes have existed for a long time. Uh, you're not supposed to target civilians or medical personnel. Uh, so there are certain um, international laws that had existed about war crimes and trying to prevent those actions. And then crimes against humanity, which was a very new idea in international law. Uh, it had never existed before as a crime in a court of law. Uh, the concept had existed for a long time, but this terminology, crimes against humanity, uh, the first time it appeared as a formal charge against anyone was at Nuremberg just the previous year before this trial started. So here we see it again at Tokyo. Now, one of the biggest confusions about the Tokyo trial is that these are your three charges, basically. Now, there were others, but these are the ones that we mostly focus on. Crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Now, some of the Japanese defendants were treated differently depending on their rank and their status in Japanese society. So this is where it gets a little confusing. These are your three charges. But then, how, as a, as a prosecution, how do you want to treat individual defendants? Uh, and so there were three charges, and then there were also three classifications um, of these war crimes being applied to these war criminals. So class A tended to be for your high-ranking military officials. So class A meant that these war criminals had conspired uh, going all the way back to 1928 they had conspired to wage war and that was considered really one of the worst possible offenses because those were your high-ranking military officials and that was that charge uh, derived from Nuremberg this conspiracy this was a grand conspiracy that you know at Nuremberg these Nazis had conspired for years for decades to wage war against uh, the world, and here we see the Japanese doing the same kinds of things. They're conspiring, uh, going back uh, almost two decades in 1928 to wage war. So there was 
Class A, and that was typically reserved for the high-ranking military officials who were put on trial in Tokyo. Then we had Class B, so these were uh, individuals who were charged with war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, and then you had Class C, which was planning, ordering, authorizing, or failing to prevent these crimes, war crimes and crimes against humanity. So oftentimes, people who were treated as Class B war criminals were also treated as Class C. So oftentimes you would see these Class B, C criminals. Um, oftentimes Class B and C came together, so you'd see them as B, C. So this part down here is new. This was not even at the Nuremberg trial. Uh, Nuremberg did not uh, uh, pursue individuals who had failed to prevent uh, crimes. These are these are this is like a crime of omission. Uh, so this is where uh, Tokyo trial differs uh, from the Nuremberg trial. It had this Class C portion that said uh, we're going to charge you for war crimes uh, if you planned, ordered, or authorized them. Obviously, that, that makes sense. But then this last part failing to prevent. So if you are a Japanese commander and your troops go into a city and they rape civilians and they plunder uh, the city and, and they burn down all these homes and buildings, which are war crimes, you know, you as the commander are liable because you did not prevent that from happening. This happened on your watch and you are culpable. Uh, so that was a very different interpretation of, of law that had really never existed before. Uh, this is an image of the Tokyo courtroom. Uh, I want to emphasize that in the background, there are 11 flags representing 11 different countries. And you can see the judges sitting here in the front. So 11 different uh, judges for the Tokyo war crimes trial. You also can see a, a camera here and a tripod. So the whole event was filmed. Obviously, someone is standing in the back of the courtroom here taking this picture so that we have this picture. Um, so that's the Tokyo courtroom. The Japanese defendants. You can see them standing here in the dock. Um, all of them here. There are more than 25 of them. And um, Tojo. Uh, Tojo, who had been uh, the prime minister, it was responsible for the ordering the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, he is really the, the big name figure that people think of when they know about the Tokyo trial. A lot of us focus on him. Uh, you can see him wearing a headset, so the trial was taking place in English and Japanese. Uh, if someone was speaking in English and you couldn't understand, you wear the headset and you can hear uh, a different language. You could there, there was simultaneous translation throughout much of the trial. Um, so you could hear interpreters translating in real time what people were saying into different languages. Um, now, I wanted you to look at a lengthier reading. So John Dower wrote a book. It's called uh, Embracing Defeat, um, Japan in the Wake of World War II. It's a very big book. I mean, it's a very, most most history books are very, very big. Okay, so it's a very big book. All right, very thick. And this is just one chapter out of the whole book. Uh, it won lots of awards, so it was universally praised uh, for uh, his, his research and his writing. I want you to notice the fact that he won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for this book. Uh, so he's very, very well credentialed as a history professor from MIT. He's retired now, got his PhD from Harvard. But I wanted you to look at a specific chapter that looked at the Tokyo trial. So it's called uh, the chapter is called Victor's Justice, Loser's Justice. And I want you to think about these questions. Um, what were the challenges uh, based on what you read in Dower? What were the challenges to organizing and conducting? I'm sorry, let's just say conducting, not conducing, sorry, uh, the Tokyo trial. Uh, how did the trials in Tokyo and Nuremberg compare? I've already mentioned some of those, but think about similarities and differences between those two things, and, and Dower brings that out. Was the trial fair? What does the chapter title mean? This is very important. Uh, people don't choose titles at random. They have reasons for choosing titles. So what does the title mean? You know, what does Victor's justice mean? What does loser's justice mean in the context of this chapter? So be thinking about all of that and why would he choose this title? Uh, that, that'll be part of our discussion on this reading. That I know it's longer, but it's very important that you are exposed to um, a little bit more uh, sophisticated writing 
It can be a little bit more dense and complicated, but try not to get lost in all the details and think about these questions as you go along and let that guide your reading. So how should we remember the, the Tokyo trial today? Um, I do want to take a moment here since I'm focusing on this historian, John Dower. Uh, he wrote in 1999, but I do want to give you a brief, very brief um, synopsis of how historians have changed their perspective of this trial uh, since it began in the 1940s. So um, in the 1940s, the earliest scholars who had looked at this trial, whether they were from Japan or the U.S., uh, usually fell into one of two camps. The first camp, they were called trial critics. And they said, you know, this is an example of victor's justice, and they meant that in a negative way. This is revenge. This is just revenge disguised as law. Those were the trial critics, and the trial analysts said, no, 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 the trial was successful because it upholds humanitarian principles in international law. And uh, we know now, uh, looking backward, we know now that international law incorporates a lot of the humanitarian principles that uh, come up at the Tokyo trial, and even before that at the Nuremberg trial. So in the 40s and 50s, you know, Japanese and American scholars who were looking at this event and they were they were split. You know, they were saying this is revenge. Other side was saying no, this was fair. Fast forward into the 1970s, and you have um, an American, an American historian, saying this trial was America's self-righteous foreign policy, and he was writing during the Vietnam War. So think about this, an event that was taking place during this historian's life was influencing the way he was looking at the Tokyo trial. His point was that the United States was being self-righteous in Vietnam in the 1960s and 70s, and so here he was writing in 1971, I think, and his point is that, you know, the United States is being self-righteous in Vietnam, and you can go back and find that same self-righteous foreign policy attitude in the 1946 Tokyo trial. Uh, and his work is very popular even to this day. And then the 1980s, you had a Japanese scholar say that the prosecution of high-ranking officials helped Japan atone uh, for the wrongdoing it had committed. Um, so a lot of different views uh, over the last few, few decades. Interestingly enough, in 2006, a Japanese news outlet conducted a poll. Uh, this was going to lead up to the 60th anniversary of when the Tokyo trial started. And uh, so they conducted this poll, and I want to share some of the results with you. Um, one of the questions, some of the questions they asked, you know, what do you think Japan, what, what kind of war do you think Japan took part in? And there's not a majority here. Remember that a majority has to be more than 50%. We don't have that here. But a plurality of people thought that the war had uh, both aspects, uh, the war of aggression and a war of self-defense. To what degree do you think each of the following bears responsibility for the war? So choose either the emperor, the military, the politicians, the media, or the people. And I think it's interesting here that as they're ranking from extremely heavy responsibility to heavy responsibility to some degree of responsibility to no responsibility, you can see that the highest number here is the military, that the, the people who were polled responded that the military um, had the extremely heavy responsibility um, more than any other uh, group. After the war, America and the other allied nations convicted Japan's war leaders as Class A war criminals at the IMTFE. To what extent do you know about these trials? Look at this. 53% said that they know something about the trials. They know they took place, but they don't know the details. Very few know the trials very well. And then 23% know the trials somewhat. 17% don't even know about the trials. Didn't even know what happened. At the Tokyo trial, seven people were eventually hanged and 25 were found guilty, uh, which among the following is the closest to your impression of the trials. And again, the trials had problems, but were necessary to bring closure. So that is a group of Japanese people who were polled in 2006, and they, even they believed the trials were good, they were necessary. They had problems, but they were necessary. So be thinking about U.S.-Japanese relations. We are almost done with our unit on Japan. So be looking at the uh, treaties that the United States and Japan signed in the 50s and 1960 uh, as we move forward here, looking at the, the end of this unit. And then also at the end of the unit, you'll have the second part of your portfolio assignment on Japan. So be thinking about that too. 
That's all I've got, ladies and gentlemen. So have a great day, and I will see you next time.